Good morning. Welcome to Grace. Let's stand together as we worship the Lord. Take a seat. Good morning, Grace. Morning, Grace. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Hey, one of my uh, favorite things that we do here at Grace is uh, family and baby dedication. And the reason we do it, the way that we do, is we see it in Scripture. We see. Uh, Jesus being brought to the temple, being dedicated, 
Uh, we see Samuel being brought to the temple and dedicated. So it's just an opportunity uh, for us to bless the child, to dedicate the child. But I also just want to make sure uh, that we understand that this is much about dedicating you, the extended family, as it is the children. So with that in mind, uh, this is my wife, Meg. We're going to walk through this. But if you guys want to all come up, probably be better to go this way, less cords uh, to walk over. So if you come around, come up. Uh, extended family, bring them all up. Everybody, bring them all. <laughs> come on up. This is fun. All the babies. Why don't you come up this way just a little bit, Maggie, so that everybody can be like, if we can kind of stay in front a little bit so you're in the light, that would be helpful. Come forward just a little bit. Everybody wants to move back. Everybody's afraid of the... Very nice. Come on Here forward. Come. come on. Hey. <laughs> oh, you can't sleep awesome. through this. This is an important moment. <laughs> huh. That's what they usually say about my preaching. Mom said worship music he puts him to he sleep. Wakes he wakes up for my <laughs> preaching? Well, that's... Hey. Come on. Come on. All right, so we're going to start with just uh, introducing who's up here, introduce the extended family and who's being dedicated, and we'll just pass the mic down. All right. So who are you, and who are they, and who is this? Who am I? Uh, my name is Elvis Torres, and this is my beautiful wife, Emma Torres, and this is our baby boy, Emmett John, and uh, this is... Dad and Emmett match. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. So yeah, we, very we good. Um, so we have uh, our family here supporting us today. We have our my sister-in-law, Hannah, my mother-in-law, uh, Deborah, and my father-in-law, John. Hey, and we actually have a few more over there. Uh, our cousin, uh, Becky and Joe, and Joe, and Talia, who is uh, always helping us with uh, Emmett as well. So that's uh, the family we brought over All right. today. It's your moment, Emmett. Hey. Yeah. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Sean Sullivan. This is my wife, Shannon, and our son, Theodore. Uh, we got a squad up here today. I wasn't expecting them all. So we got my mom and my sister, Kristen and Molly. Uh, the godparents, Kevin and Suzanne Quasarano. Uh, Jim and Mary Ellen. Uh, David and Grace. And I think Nathan and Christian. Yep, we got, we got a, whole, a whole squad. So Nice. And we got more family in the, in the crowd there. So Great. Hi, good morning. My name is Noah Stricker. This is my lovely wife, Danny, and this is our daughter, Lydia Joy. Um, Aww, <laughs> what, Lydia gets in awe? The other babies yeah. get nothing? What's up with that? It's Danny is really good with photography. So uh, we're, we're oh, it was the um, photo. But, uh, we're joined here today by my parents, Steve and Chris Stricker, and uh, two of my brothers, Luke and John. Nice. That's awesome. All these uncles. <laughs> So uh, one of the things we do is Meg and I uh, pray uh, about your child and we ask the Lord for a passage of scripture and a word for each one of them. And then Meg has um, been gracious enough to kind of capture those in a card um, that we'll give to you. Uh, but it's better that she wrote it than I did because you'll be able to actually read it now. Uh, but she's going to go ahead and read the cards and what we felt like the Lord gave us for each of your children. And then we'll... As she finishes, I'm going to anoint each of the children with a little bit of oil. This is so exciting. Hi, Lydia. <laughs> Beloved Lydia, God gave us this verse for you. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's Psalm 1611. May you always be attuned to the voice of God and follow the adventurous path he sets before you. May you know deep in your spirit the joy you have brought to your family. God delights in you. Love you, Lydia. Sweet girl. Oh. I dedicate you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, I love those Amen. cheeks. <laughs> Hi, Theodore and Theodore's family. Hi, <laughs> guys. Theodore's support team. Dear Theodore, God gave us this verse for you. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. That's from Psalm 37.3. 
We pray for you to have a deep hunger for God from your youth and always. May you desire to know him more, love him more, and honor him in all you do. <laughs> he smiled and as soon as she started he, praying. He, he smiled from ear to ear. And may his love ground you. We love you, buddy. Beautiful. You. Sweet little man. Your dad. Dedicate you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Mm. <laughs> hey, Emmett. <laughs> How are you, buddy? Good to see you. Dear Emmett, the verse God gave us for you is Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, and what is acceptable and perfect. Our prayer is that you will follow Jesus this day and every day going forward. May your life be an example to others as you live in the center of God's good and perfect will. God bless you and keep you, Emmett. I dedicate you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bless you. You want me to get the books? Yeah. Okay. I also have a book for you, for the parents, Power of a Praying Parent, and um, it's an oldie, I'll say that, but this is a book that shaped my prayers for my kids, and so I just wanted to pass that on to you, and then there's one for Power of a Praying Grandparent. <laughs> Here, Sean, I'll give that to you. I'm going to see if there's one for godparents, oh, sure. but, <laughs> and where's, there we go, grandparents. And you're a grandparent, and this is for you guys. You're welcome. So as I said earlier, this is as much about uh, a dedication of the families as it is the children. Uh, the passage that I always go back to uh, for baby dedication is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These commandments I give to you today are to be upon your hearts, so they're to be in you, but impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and wherever you go. And really, the idea here is the greatest gift that each of you can give these little people is your own walk with God. As you uh, grow, as you become more and more like Jesus, they're going to see that, and they're going to be inspired to do the same. So your walk with God is instrumental. And part of what this verse is saying is keep your walk with God front and center. You don't necessarily have to write them on the walls, but that's not necessarily a bad thing either, but that they would see your faith, that you would talk about your faith, that you would be willing to share your struggles as well as your victories as you walk with Jesus. So uh, I'm going to read uh, some statements. They're just covenants. I would uh, encourage everyone that's up here with the children to just kind of affirm that with the words we will. So you're here this morning to dedicate this child uh, with the desire that they would follow Jesus with that in mind. Uh, just affirm the following statements with we will. We will model a life of faith in Jesus by seeking after him in our own lives. We will commit to praying for and praying with our child. And we will do all that we can to direct, direct this child towards a personal relationship with Jesus. Well, why don't you stand with me just as a way of affirming that we're in this together as a community of believers. God, thank you so much for each one of these uh, children. Thank you for the fact that you uh, love them more than their parents do, even if that's hard for us to wrap our minds around, uh, that your love uh, just is so beautiful and so overwhelming. I pray that all three of these uh, little people would just grow up with that understanding, that they would know uh, just how loved they are, not just by their family, but by you, and uh, that they would have a rich and beautiful walk with Jesus. We thank you for each one of them and ask that you would bless them and grow them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being a part of this. And uh, you can remain standing because we're going to continue to worship. Thanks. And let's go this way if we can. Amen. We want to teach you a new song this morning. Uh, it's called Son of Suffering, and it comes from Isaiah chapter 53. And so I'll read you just the first few verses. It says this, um, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root of dry ground. It's a prophecy about Jesus. 
He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And the truth is that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who uh, made a way for us to be saved, also um, was fully human in his time here on earth. And so I, I've really, it's really stood out to me, just that idea that Jesus, it says, was a man of sorrows. He's acquainted with grief. And so he knew the things that we would wrestle with. He knew the things that would make us sad and the things that would bring us joy. And his compassion for us is, is real because he can empathize because he was fully God and fully human. And so it's him who chose to make a way for us to know our Father. And so the song is really just a... Uh, kind of testimony of Jesus, who he is, what he accomplished, and the freedom and the healing that's available to us through uh, the Son of God. So I want to teach you the chorus, and then we'll sing the rest together. It goes like this. Oh, but in tears, how can it be that there's a God who weeps, there's a God who Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. Oh, the perfect son of God in all his innocence and in walking in the dirt with you. A living age, he's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Oh, blood and tears, how can it be that there's a God who weeps? There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the Stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, and glory to God in heaven. Your blood still speaking, your love still reaching. All praise, King Jesus, and glory to God forever.
Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand.
God, we thank you that you are faithful even when we're not. And Lord, I thank you that uh, even when we experience pain and disappointment and loss, that you are who you have always been, a faithful God who loves us, who cares for us, and who desires to walk with us through it all. So help us to do that, Lord. When we're celebrating victory and triumph, when we're um, just experiencing pain and grief and loss, would you lead us to come to you, to walk with you? That you would help us, that you'd comfort us, that you'd lead us, that you would tell us what's true, and that you'd make us more like your son, Jesus. We thank you that he um, demonstrated what it meant to follow you. And he demonstrated how much you love us, Lord, by giving his life. So would everything we do be in response to your love and your goodness, your faithfulness, as we give to you, as we have an opportunity to do each week and really every day, Lord. Teach us how to give to you for your purposes, for your kingdom, and as a response to your love. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I'm the women's ministry coordinator here. Thank you. It's my joy to welcome you today. Thank you. Um, well, if you are new or newer to Grace, uh, we would love to meet you and answer any questions you have. So you can text hello to this number on the screen. Um, if you're online, you can click the link and uh, fill that out. If you're a um, pen and paper person like me, there's a card in the seat back in front of you that says I'm new. You can fill that out and um, turn it into the information desk after service. Uh, the women's ministry has a theme uh, this year. It is um, Together We. And um, we've got some really exciting events coming up where we, um, together we grow, together we worship, together we serve. It's going to be awesome. But the most recent event is our Abide in the Vine Afterglow, and um, it's together we remember. So if you were at the retreat in the fall, you know how awesome it was. Um, if you were not able to attend, this is a great opportunity to taste and see just a little bit of what that weekend was about. There will be breakfast and worship, and uh, Shanae Shoemake will be back to give a little teach and um, that is $10 per person. Please register soon. Um, the retreat sold out, and I'm sure this will too, um, especially if you need child care. If you need child care, please register by March 1st. Um, if you have any questions about anything regarding women's ministry, we've got a thriving moms group, senior sisters uh, gathering, uh, Bible studies, any questions you have, you can look online for all that information, or you can come see me today um, at the group's corner after service. And there's one more event I'm going to, there it is, Discover Grace. Uh, this is Sunday, March 10th. This is the best way uh, to learn everything you'd want to know about Grace. Um, it's a casual and fun dinner. Um, you'll get to meet some of the church leaders while you're there um, and gain a better understanding of who we are. This is also a first step in the membership process, so if you're um, considering making Grace your family home, please uh, register for that as well. There is child care and dinner provided. So um, that's all for the announcements. Uh, please stand and greet the neighbor next to you and say, glad you're here. Thank you.
Good morning, Grace. How are you doing this morning? All right. Why are you clapping? Nothing. You haven't heard anything yet. You might want to reserve that until you hear what I have to say. Okay, let's do that. Um, yeah, so, you know, I felt this way after first service. I feel this way still that this message is basically like an exclamation point on all the things we, pray, we worshiped about and all the things we sang. And hopefully you'll see that. We didn't connect really in terms of planning the songs. And somebody, connect, somebody planned this because they just connected really well. I think God is real. So um, which, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you this morning. We thank you for every heart and mind and soul that is what, here physically in the building or even watching online. We believe that you've prepared this moment for each and every one of us, and we just invite the Spirit to do the work you've planned to do in the hearts and minds and souls of those who will be hearing this message. And so we just invite your presence and guidance. We know you're already here, but we want you to do some things in us that are immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine. We need you, Jesus. So we just pray that you'd speak to us and that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I was once in a conversation with some pastors and the subject of God's sovereignty came up. And when we talk about sovereignty, we're talking about supreme power and authority. God is omnipotent all-powerful. He made you and me. He is the maker of heaven and earth. But I noticed that for some of these pastors, based on their theological tradition, God's power and authority looks a little differently, or is responded to a little differently, actually. Some would see God's power and authority as something to cower before, something to watch out for, like a stick that's going to hit you the moment you go in the wrong direction. How many of us see God that way? One who seems to relish the idea of messing up, of you messing up so he can slap you upside the head. For others, God's sovereignty is more like the weighted blanket that I bought for Tanya one Christmas. You put this blanket over you in the recliner or the couch and you feel this weight kind of cover you and hug you and you feel rested underneath it. When you see God's sovereignty that way, God's sovereignty is not a weapon, it's a comfort. Our conception of God is often based upon things we've been told or heard, but not necessarily coming directly from the text. In the book, Having the Mind of Christ, Matt Tebby and Ben Sternke write that over time, followers of Jesus develop hidden assumptions about God, assumptions that need to be addressed if you and I are developed to develop a healthy relationship with God based upon his word. They assert that one of the reasons our efforts to adopt new practices to help us grow in our walk with God, when they fail, it's because we carry old and unhelpful paradigms of reality that are, end up working against our faith. Addressing these paradigms is necessarily introspective work, work that calls for us not only just to know the right things, but work that calls for us to dig into who we are, how we've been formed, and how we relate to God and his personhood. And how to do so rightly. Today's chapter is Genesis 26. And the subject is not God's sovereignty, but God's faithfulness. But there's a, a similarity. How do we respond to God in his faithfulness? What does God's faithfulness mean in us and to us? Do we use his faithfulness as a point of shame, being reminded that God is faithful and unlike him, we are trash? Or do we let God love us as we're reminded that he is eternally faithful toward us? He is a promise-making and promise-keeping God who never fails. During this series, we've heard about God's sovereignty in creation as he spoke reality into existence. God as a promise-keeping God. And today, we're talking about the faithfulness of God. And I would just say, these are all good. We are to trust in the character of God. 
well, what, is, what are all these truths doing in us? How, how are all these truths impacting us, transforming us, shaping and changing the way we see ourselves, the way we see others, the way we engage the world? How have you been impacted by God's faithfulness toward you? Last week we began with the story of Jacob, and this week we're going back to his dad, Isaac. Now, there's a strong likelihood that the events that are taking place we're about to read in, in chapter 26 actually happened before chapter 25, but this was put in place for structural reasons in the book of Genesis. As Pastor Doug has noted, it's not uncommon in Genesis or the Bible for their things to be not necessarily in chronological order, but God is unfolding a story and doing it the way he's chosen to. Now, I'm going to look at this chapter in four major sections. Verses 1 and 5 are about God's promise to Isaac. 6 through 11 are about Isaac's protection. 12 through 22, Isaac's prosperity. And 23 through 25, God is reaffirming his promise to Isaac. And then 26 through 31, God is giving Isaac peace. So if you're able, would you please stand while I read Genesis 26, verses 1 through 5. Now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and I will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Thank you. You may be seated. So when I first read this chapter, there was just this, when I was preparing to teach it, there was a strong temptation for me to make it about generational sin and to make it about Abraham's faithfulness that ended up blessing Isaac and to use it as an example of how we can be faithful and we can bless our children and why all those things are good. It's not how I entirely see the passage today. Abraham is faithful. God says so. And we know Abraham made some foolish choices for which God forgave him. What we need to remember here is that God is doing something specific and unique in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You may have noticed that we've referred to them as the patriarchs. The patriarch means ruling fathers. It's a term specifically related to this trinity of dads as a foundation of what would become Israel, literally Jacob's future name. God's plan to save humanity was always going to be through bringing his physical son to earth. But for that to be the case, his physical son needed to be born into a family like the babies we saw dedicated today. God's son was a culturally specific, embodied, gendered individual intentionally born to a people with a specific history and legacy. Starting with the faithfulness of Abraham, but also including the brutality of slavery in Egypt, the beauty of the Davidic kingdom, and the horror of being cast out of the promised land in exile. We must remember, humanly, Jesus was born into this kind of people, their culture, their background, the way they saw themselves and the world, this history. They formed him. It formed the, the, the place he grew up in, the family and the people he grew up among. His past mattered, and his past shaped his upbringing. Now, the Israelites for whom Genesis was originally written could not have seen this. But how you and I read this from our vantage point is that God is faithful to Isaac because God is faithful to Abraham, because God is faithful to his word, because God is faithfully going to bring Jesus through this family. Abraham is his first dad and Isaac is the next dad. 
So as we read, Isaac had to leave the land because they were living in a, they were a, there was a famine going on. And it's very similar to Abraham's story, which actually is referenced in uh, the text that I read. Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, is likely the son or grandson of the Abimelech who had dealings with Abraham. Some think the name Abraham is more like a title than a proper name. So Isaac's plan was to go into Egypt because that's where all the, the, the abundance was, the resources, the food. He was leaving a famine, but God said, don't go there. And Isaac obeyed. And God makes Isaac five promises. God tells Isaac, I will be with you. I will bless you. I will give all these lands to you and your offspring. I will establish the oath I swore to your father and I will multiply your offspring. Then God tells Isaac why. Why? This is why. Because of Abraham, who did what God asked of him. And then God uses five specific ways to describe Abraham's faithfulness. God says, Abraham obeyed my voice. Abraham kept my charge. Abraham kept my commandments. Abraham kept my statutes. Abraham kept my laws. Grace, we've been through the life of Abraham. Did Abraham do all those things faithfully? Do you remember Abraham never making a mistake, keeping all of his commandments, obeying God's voice the whole time? Don't worry, it's not a test. It's just a question. Uh, if you have test anxiety, settle down. It'll be okay. We read about Abraham. We know that Abraham made some boo-boos. He made some mistakes. He didn't do what was right completely all the time. But we also read in Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed God and God credited it to Abraham as righteousness. So now, this is how God sees Abraham, as obedient. Friends, you and I commit sins. You all commit sins. I do too. You all do some jacked up stuff, stuff that God didn't tell you to do. Yeah, I know about you. But when you and I believe God, when you and I trust in his son, when you and I submit to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God, we, the Bible says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that through him we might become his righteousness. God saw Abraham as righteous when we know he sinned. God sees you as righteous when we know you've sinned because of your trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. Because God is faithful. So after these promises God makes, we see God granting Isaac three specific blessings. We see God giving Isaac protection, God giving Isaac prosperity, and God giving Isaac peace. They all underscore the power of God's faithfulness. We read in Verses 6 through 11. God in his faithfulness protects Isaac. In Genesis 20, we read earlier an account of Abraham going to the same place in Gerar, dealing with an Abimelech, fearing for his life because he had a really attractive wife that he thought would get him killed because they would want her. When, a when Abraham lied then, God had made a covenant with Abraham. God had made promises to Abraham. God had reaffirmed his favor for Abraham. God had promised all these things for Abraham, and yet and still God, Abraham did not trust in the faithfulness of God in the moment when he said, say you're my sister, otherwise they're going to kill me. Here his son Isaac does the exact same thing out of the same fear. My good-looking wife is going to get me murdered. But Abimelech sees Isaac and Rebekah interacting in a way that made it clear they were married. And Abimelech says, what is this you've done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt among us, uh, upon us. So Abraham, Abimelech rather warned all the people saying, whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isaac is thus protected humanly by Abimelech's decree, but ultimately because of God's faithfulness and his sovereignty. One commentator writes that Isaac's fear for his own life are to, said, shown to be without foundation. As God promised, he's with Isaac and he's blessing Isaac. The faithful God not only protects Isaac, we see here, we read further that he prospers Isaac. 
In verse 12, we read that God blessed Isaac and he became rich, sowing and reaping a hundredfold, which sounds awesome, but it's a lot, especially in a time of famine. He gained so much that the Philistines grew envious of him. And they're like, you can't stay in the same place with us. You need to leave. One caveat, and I'm sure this is probably going to fall differently on different ears. Please do not equate economic prosperity all the time with divine blessing. The English Standard Version Study Bible notes that say that wealth is always divine blessing, but I don't think that's true. I think it's a materialistic view, and I think that we're reading our culture into the text when we do that. Certainly God can and does bless people with resources, but a quick snapshot of followers of Jesus for the past 2,000 years would indicate that faithful Christians are not all prosperous and living off the fat of the land. After first service, I was talking with some guys um, in the Cafe Grace, and they were talking about going on a mission trip, and there's Christians in parts of the world where people have dirt floors, and they have virtually nothing, and yet they're joyful. How many people know there are people like that? And in and, and, and reality, sometimes when people are living like that, wealth ends up doing something else in them. It ends up not being a blessing. I've heard somebody say before, especially when they talk about athletes and they get contracts, that getting a lot of wealth doesn't change you. It just reveals who you really are. And that's not always good. Many people who love and honor God around the world and historically have suffered economically and politically. I'm not saying that wealth is never a sign of divine blessing. It's not always a sign of divine blessing. And poverty is not necessarily a a sign of divine dishonor. But it doesn't take away from the reality of this chapter that God is intentionally and faithfully blessing Isaac in keeping with God's promises to Abraham. Then we read of tension in verses 17 through 22 as herdsmen quarreled with Isaac and his people over wells in the land until they moved far enough away that there was no one left to quarrel with anymore. Isaac's prospering at the hand of God doesn't come without tension with the people around him. The Philistines were envious of his wealth and they forced Isaac and his people to move. One thing you and I might learn from this is that sometimes we might think if our path isn't always smooth sailing, then God must not be in it. But the reality is God could very well be working in the midst of challenges and struggles that we're going through. As a matter of fact, I feel comfortable saying God is working in the challenges and the struggles that we're going through. I'm not saying God is causing them. We live in a fallen world. But God is seeking to do something in your life all the time, despite whether you're struggling or whether you're on top of the world. And our job is to try to discern what it is he wants to do. What does he want? How does he want us to respond? John Piper once said that God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of three of them. (laughs) Our job is to stay connected to him and follow Jesus, not necessarily try to figure out what's the easiest way, as if if we do something that's super easy, then it must be anointed by God, because that's not necessarily true. Sometimes it's the exact opposite. The easy thing may not be what God wants us to do. So in verses 23 through 25, as we continue, we read that God in his faithfulness reaffirms this promise to Isaac after those two events. We read that from there, Isaac went up to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to Isaac the same night. And he said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So Isaac built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. So reading that God is repeating his commitment to bless Isaac. And I really appreciate God says, fear not, because Isaac literally spoke about fear that he was experiencing when he lied about his wife earlier. God knows what's going on in his heart and God is speaking directly to his heart. You don't have to fear. God is recorded as appearing to Isaac twice in this chapter. And each time he mentions Abraham twice. Because Abraham, God's promises to Abraham are what God is remembering as he's promising his his family. So we've seen God give Isaac protection and prosperity. And finally, in this passage, as a result of God's faithfulness, 
Isaac is experiencing peace. Abimelech is so impressed with the way God is blessing Isaac, he wants to ensure that he's on Isaac's good side. Isaac is becoming a threat because of how much wealth he's gaining. First, the Philistines had been scared, and they told Isaac to get away because of all your wealth. So Isaac left, and I see this as an ancient Near Eastern affirmation of mo' money, mo' problems. Yeah, about the same number of people left first service. And I told them, you guys talk to each other outside over there. You'll figure it out after the service is over. But Isaac keeps prospering. So now they come to him asking for a covenant of peace. Now Abimelech, Abimelech says to Isaac, you are now blessed of the Lord, confirming to Isaac what God had been telling Isaac he was going to do for them. Abimelech is calling out what God was saying I was going to do for you. It's really interesting sometimes when we receive something from God, like God's going to do something for us. And then somebody in the world is calling out, wow, God is really blessing you. Or, wow, look at you. That's amazing. It's just an, another affirmation. So they make a pact of peace and they exchange an oath and they dig a well and they name it after the oath. So we have read and seen in this passage about God making promises to Isaac and then God giving Isaac protection and prosperity and peace. And all of them are indicative of God's sovereign power and God's faithfulness to his promises. God was not just faithful to Isaac, though. God is faithful to you and to me. How has his faithfulness proven itself in your life? Do you take the time to not just say God is faithful and go on about your business, but maybe spend intentional time chronicling, documenting, writing down the specific ways you've seen God do things for you and in you? You give God praise for specific ways God has blessed you and, 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 and it's just been faithful to his promises, been faithful to you, heard your requests and responded faithfully in prayer. See, God's faithfulness is not just intended to be a theological doctrine that we're supposed to believe. His faithfulness is intended to change us and make us, help us respond in faith because of what Jesus has done for us. Do we let God's faithfulness do that in our lives? I can tell you God's faithfulness has impacted me. I grew up in a Christian home, grew up in the church. My parents met and married at the church I grew up in. But from about the time of my driver's license to my marriage license, I stopped attending church. And God wasn't relevant in my life during that time. I wasn't living faithfully. I was doing whatever I chose. I stopped seeking God in any meaningful way. But God didn't cut me off. God remained faithful to me. When Tanya and I started dating, we started attending church. And like a dear old friend you haven't spoken to for a while, my relationship with God developed and deepened. And I repented. And I'm still repenting. But I repented. And I sought God. And one thing led to another. And I'm standing here today. How about you? Take some time. Consider how God has been faithful to you. Not just theologically, not just generally, but specifically. What has God done in your life in response to your walking with him? How has he shown his faithfulness? I remember when my mom was declining. She had dementia. And I remember writing down some specific things I was praying for her for. And I don't know if it was months later or whatever else, as I was praying for her, I looked at that list and I was like, God did that. God did that. God did that. God did that. God was doing the things I was praying for her for. Is it possible God's doing things in your life you're not even attentive to because you haven't given yourself the time to document and think about and process how God is blessing and has been blessing you? And if you do and when you do, that's only going to change you going forward. God makes good on his promises. But we have to remember, as we're reading scripture in the Old Testament, specifically even, his promises to us are not the exact same promises as they are to Isaac. I would say we have it even better than Isaac has it. I remember somebody saying once that when we all get to heaven, the Old Testament saints are going to look at us and marvel and say, what was it like to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you? 
What was it like to have the Holy Spirit with you all the time? What was it like to have the Holy Spirit filling you as a people? Because they didn't experience that before the incarnation of Christ. That's God's faithfulness. And then I wonder, is that faithfulness inspiring us in response to the presence of the Holy Spirit to want to cry out and reach out to God in response, in faithfulness? What has God promised us? He's promised us his indwelling presence. He's promised us never to leave us. He's promised us that your lives and my life is hidden with Christ in God and that even in this world, though we will have trouble, Jesus has overcome the world. We can trust in these promises. And what kind of people should these promises make us? The most courageous, the most willing to be sacrificial. Our, our treasure isn't here, our treasure is in heaven. But it's not just about us processing information. I want us to think about what does it do for our transformation? One of the most fascinating aspects of Christianity to me. Christianity to me is how we are formed. We read even through Romans 8, toward the end of that chapter, we read about how God is seeking to conform our character to the character of his son, Jesus Christ. Can we say, after walking with Jesus for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, I'm seeing God conform my character to the character of his son. I'm seeing God do things in me that I wasn't seeing before. I'm responding in ways that I wasn't responding before. I have different values today than I had before. Tanya and I recently went to the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. And there's an art exhibit called Going Dark, the contemporary figure at the edge of visibility. And it was specifically an exhibit by artists of color. And they had really interesting pieces that depicted the impact of race and racialization on them and on our culture. And it just showed me the different layers that people are made of that we oftentimes don't even interrogate. But it's these very layers that God wants to unpack as he's conforming us into the image of his son. It showed, it had graphic displays of how people have been impacted and wounded and yet often made stronger due to their experiences in this country. The human experience is deep and profound and people are many layered and so much goes into our spiritual formation, probably more than we give thought to. And I think oftentimes we're we're academically minded and we think we come to Christ and just put a bunch of Bible doctrine on our heads and then we'll be changed. But we don't let that Bible doctrine interrogate our hearts. We don't let that Bible doctrine speak to our traumas or our wounds or our hurting or our brokenness. And we won't be conformed to the image of Christ unless we let Jesus Christ unpack in the gentle way he does those things inside of us that we brought to the cross in the first place. The ways our family of origin might have hurt us. The ways maybe cultural issues might have hurt us. The ways we've been broken and marred by the culture that we live in to be too individualistic or too materialistic or whatever. God is seeking to do a work in us. And it will only happen if we allow it to happen, because he's gentle with us. There's so much that makes up how we've been formed and what kinds of things need to be addressed in us as we grow in our relationship with Jesus. We can do a lot of Christian things, but stay at the surface level with God. And I'm pretty sure that there are some of us out there that maybe have such a painful background, such a painful backdrop that we just don't want to go there anymore because it's too painful. So we just want to move forward. But perhaps God wants to gently take us back there and work through some things to get the kind of healing that really will transform our lives. Heard somebody say once that if you don't address your wounds, you will bleed on people who didn't cut you. I know that happens. See, Bible knowledge was not meant to stay in our head. It's supposed to impact our heart and flow to our hands and our feet. And I hope you hear me say this. I'm not saying Bible knowledge or doctrine is not important. I'm actually saying it's more important because it's supposed to change us, not just be possessed in our brains. 
God calls us to go deeper, to challenge ourselves, to ask ourselves tough questions. And the backdrop of all of this is that we don't have to be afraid because God is faithful and will walk with us through it if we trust him. And if we're not trusting him, we won't. And we'll stay spiritually immature. Dallas Willard once said that Christianity is not about God getting us into heaven, but about God getting heaven into us. Thank you for Dal- clapping for Dallas Willard. Usually I get the most claps from, from quoting other people, which is why I got to drop those in periodically so you can stay in your P's and Q's. We're on a journey. The Christian life is a journey of ongoing transformation. It's not about getting fire insurance so you don't go to hell. It's been said that there are three tenses to salvation. I have been saved at the cross. I am being saved through ongoing spiritual maturity. And I will be saved on the last day when Jesus returns. Our ongoing salvation is called sanctification. And it's less about God forcing us to obey him against our will. And it's more about God changing us to become people who increasingly respond faithfully to him. Because that's who we're becoming. And we can lean into becoming those kind of people because God is faithful and he will walk with us through it. Philippians 6 tells us that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's a promise from God that the God who began the good work in us will carry it on to completion. So I work for the North American Baptist Conference and Grace is a member of the North American Baptist Conference. So I let the cat out of the bag. This is a Baptist church. That's why we didn't baptize any infants this morning. We dedicated them. We have a church multiplication, church planting conferences. And it's very similar to what Doug said to the parents um, on stage earlier. Um, we say at the church planting conferences, the greatest gift you can give your church is the person you're becoming. The implication is that you're becoming someone. You're on a journey. You're growing. You're changing. You're making faithful decisions. God is doing things in your heart and your life. What kind of people are we becoming? How might God's faithfulness impact the kind of people we're becoming? See, God wants to not only inform us in his faithfulness, he wants to form us by his faithfulness. And one of the ways we can tell that is because one of the nine fruit of the Spirit literally is faithfulness. God not only wants to be faithful to us, he wants to share in that character of his with us so we can be a reflection of his faithfulness to those around us. Isaac benefited from God's faithfulness, but he also sinned. He lied foolishly about his wife as if God could not keep up with his end of the bargain to bless and protect Isaac. You and I sin, you and I waver, but God never wavers. Isaac obeyed God by not going to Egypt where all the food was, but he decided to stay there. You and I have the opportunity to obey as God leads, even when humanly it doesn't necessarily look like the choice we would make. Isaac worshiped God by building an altar and calling upon the name of the Lord. You and I are called to be worshipers of God, not only in song, but in sacrifice, in obedience, and in service. God's faithfulness is the basis for our love of God. We love because he first loved us by sending his son. And his son taught us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If we love him with all our hearts, what does that look like? How do we examine our hearts? Too often, our understanding of spiritual maturity and growth is about data. It's about mastering the Bible and its contents. It might even be about looking nice and biblical to the world around us, about developing biblical answers to the hardest questions of life. So we always have an answer because there's an answer for everything in the Bible, which I don't know that there is. But that's only head knowledge which puffs up. Love builds up. Who has our hearts? What has our hearts? Is it God or is it his gifts? Instead of us mastering the Bible, is the Bible mastering us? 
more than just the parts that we like, the ones that we don't feel convicted about, but we can condemn other people about. Trusting in God's faithfulness can fuel our willingness to ask ourselves tough questions about our true loves and our true motivations. If we love the Lord, the Lord our God with all our souls, how sensitive are we to our souls? One of my coworkers used to ask regularly, how is your soul? If you honestly were going to answer a question, how is your soul, how would you answer that? Where do you go to understand what you're, what's, does that just mean am I happy? How's your soul? Lacking trust in a faithful God results in fear about digging around in our inner life, digging around in our wounds, our hurt, our trauma. But these are the very things that God in his faithfulness wants to gently unpack in us so that he can conform us and heal us and make us more like his son. Knowing God is faithful and believing God is faithful will enable us to face ourselves, to trust in his love and his strength. If we love God with all our strength, what does that even mean? Maybe it means we invest our energy in activities that build up ourselves and others. Maybe it means we honor God in our physical bodies with our habits like eating and exercise. Maybe it means that those of us with physical strength use that physical strength on behalf of those who don't have physical strength. All of which we can do because we trust the God who is faithful. If we love the Lord our God with all our mind, do we lead our thought life or do we let our thought life lead us? Are we sensitive to our inputs or are we careless? Our ongoing lives of prayer and scripture reading should season how and what we think. We can depend on God to give us the strength to grow in this area. This Lenten season is a good time to take an inventory of our thoughts and put into practice habits that shape our thoughts to honor God even more. God will help us because he is faithful. Some of us may have started Lent with a bunch of holy ambition. And we find ourselves, our plans falling flat because we didn't carry through with what we were planning. I just want to tell you, if that's you, please do not beat yourself up. Know that God is faithful. Stay engaged with him. Get re-engaged with him. Trust in him. Recommit and keep remitting, recommitting as long as you have to. Because God is a personal God. He's a promise-making and promise-keeping God. And he wants you and me this morning to rest in his faithfulness, to trust him in his faithfulness, to trust him this morning. It's his love and his faithfulness that is to motivate us to turn from sin. The picture of the angry God who wants to bop us on the head was painted by people who loved us and wanted us to turn to God by scaring us. But this has the unfortunate byproduct of describing God in a way that's not who he is. Yes, When we choose sin, we choose chaos. We choose the consequences of sin. We bring destruction and harm, not just to us, but those around us, those who love us. But God is and always remains faithful and available if we would just turn around and run back to him. We see his faithfulness in this passage today. It is a refrain we should not stop repeating to ourselves. So when we pray, we remind ourselves we're praying to a faithful God. When we read our Bible, we remind ourselves we're reading the words of a faithful God. When we sing praises and worship on Sundays or in our car during the week, we're praising and worshiping our God who is faithful. When we serve in church, no matter what we're doing, we serve with all our love and energy because our faithfulness is to point beyond ourselves to the faithfulness of the Father. And when we get bad news, and we will get bad news, when we become discouraged or disappointed, when we experience the tensions of life and challenges of living in a fallen world, we preach to ourselves again and again and again and again that we will be okay because our God is faithful and will never leave us. We cannot ever forget that God is faithful and his promises of what we will be in the future 
because he is faithful and has shown his faithfulness, are to transform us even today. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We say great is thy faithfulness. We worship and praise you, and we just invite you to have your way with us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be willing to and able to take the time to recount all the ways, the specific blessings you've given us. We pray, Lord God, if there's some things we need to unpack with you and with someone who loves and trusts you that can walk with us, that we do that in, that in a place of safety, and that we'd invite your Holy Spirit in because that is indicative of our belief and trust that you are faithful. Work in grace, work through grace, work in us, that you would be glorified and we continue to be transformed to the image of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. A couple things. I want to uh, remind you the Stations of the Resurrection is going to happen now until 1 p.m., which is like 38 minutes. So you got 38 minutes from right now. Um, and then tonight from 5.30 to 7 p.m. as well, the Stations of the Resurrection that are back in the chapel. And also, uh, there are people praying for you uh, before second service, and this is what they heard. And I invite anybody who wants prayer to come down here and pray. There will be prayer counselors who want to pray for you and with you. Uh, but these are some specific things. If these resonate with you, certainly come down. Someone, uh, they heard joy of the Lord is needed in your life. Uh, we heard the gift of faith. For somebody needs to forgive themselves. And deliverance from addiction or grief. If those might resonate with you, please come down, even if they didn't. If you want to pray for people who might have experienced, be experiencing these things, pray for them. But uh, feel free to end the service coming down in prayer. Thank you so much, and I pray that you have a wonderful week. Take care.